Hey, it's Megan. I'm a professional writer and writing coach. I'm really glad you're here today because we're going to be talking about the writing in one of my favorite movies. It's a classic, Back to the Future. Welcome back. If you're new here, it's so good to meet you. I recently rewatched this movie and realized it was actually pretty well written, so I thought we could talk about it today and see what we can take from it for our own writing projects. The screenplay was written by Michael Gale and Robert Zemeckis, and Robert Zemeckis was also the director, so let's start. Making the best deals of the year on all 1985 model Toyotas. You won't find a better car at a better... So you can see already we're getting some exposition. As we think about our own writing projects, we want to think about how we're setting up the scene for our story. So in this opening clip, we get not only the exposition of what month it is and what year it is, which will come into play later, but we also get a sense of this invention motif. You see a picture of Edison and a couple of other, other inventors in this room, and you see a lot of clocks. So we're getting a sense that time is going to take a big focus in this movie, which of course we already know. The clocks just really show Doc's obsession with time. Other things to think about in this opening scene are that it's this room is very chaotic, it's very messy. The TV's going while their coffee is running and there's no pot to catch the coffee. Like it's very chaotic and that kind of gives us a sense of Doc as a character before we even meet him. Hey, Doc. And then we have an introduction to Marty. And so what do we see? He's a young kid. He's dressed pretty casually. He comes in on a skateboard. These are all details that are really going to play a role in his character throughout the movie. And then we see him connect himself to the amp, turn it all the way up and blow himself back into the room. So we get a sense that maybe he's a little bit reckless, but it also gives us an early connection to his character's love for music, especially rock and roll. So why does this matter if we're writing a story? At the beginning of any story, you want to give your readers a sense of the world that they're stepping into. One thing I liked about Back to the Future is we don't actually ever learn anything about how Marty and Doc came to know each other. They just know each other and we kind of just buy into their relationship and we're like, this is normal. How did they even meet? We don't know, but we're just tossed into their world and we don't even have time to question it because of what unfolds. Another thing to keep in mind in this opening scene is they give us a reference to the missing plutonium. What I loved about this movie when I rewatched it was I realized how many hints they gave in the beginning to things that happen later on. And that's such a great writing technique. Give your readers clues, let every detail matter. There's a quote by Anton Chekhov that says basically if there's a gun hanging on the wall in your character's house in scene one, then that gun needs to go off at some point later on in the story. Basically meaning don't give any details that aren't pertinent to the story. Wait a minute, 115 in the morning? Doc, what's going on? So here we get the introduction to the secondary character Doc and the first inciting incident. So Doc is inviting Marty to come to the mall and meet him at 115 a.m. Immediately we have a sense of intrigue, even Marty has it. He's like, in the morning, 1.15, what's going on? And Doc says he's made a major breakthrough. And then there's this curiosity around what is he inviting Marty to get into? I work. They're all exactly 25 minutes slow. So even here we get an insight into Doc's character. He's been experimenting with time, even through all of these clocks that are in his house. And his experiment is to get them to run 25 minutes behind. So he's playing with time in some way, which I think is a great intro to his character. Damn, I'm late for school. And then of course we get more character development for Marty. A, he just blew up his friend's amp and B, he's late for school, which we will learn is not necessarily out of character for him. And then we just gotta give a moment for this song. Why is Jennifer running out of school just at the moment when Marty's coming in? If you get caught, it'll be four tardies in a row. So there we get more of Marty's character development in one line. If you get caught, it'll be four tardies in a row. We understand that he's perhaps not the best student. One thing I would encourage you guys to notice when you're watching this movie is the number of conflicts that the characters go through. The characters face obstacles almost every scene in this movie, and that's what you want in scenes when you're writing. Even if it's a small obstacle, you want every scene to take your character from point A to point B. For example, in the first scene, what happens? Marty plugs his guitar into the amp and he faces an obstacle. It doesn't go the way he plans. What's the next obstacle he faces or conflict he faces? He's late for school. He finds out he's late. It gets us wondering what's going to happen next. Then he arrives at school. What happens? He gets caught. So it's another conflict, another obstacle. He gets that other tardy slip. The so-called Dr. Brown is dangerous. He's a real nutcase. Then we get more character development about Doc. Again, not from Doc, but from what other people are saying about him. You've got a real attitude problem, McFly. You're a slacker. You remind me of your father when he went here. He was a slacker too. And this line is another Easter egg, another little clue that is left in the beginning that will come into play later on in the film. We'll, we'll get back to that. For the pits. For the pits. 
Pinheads. <laughs> I love this scene because, again, it's a clue for what's to come. <laughs> Marty and his band are auditioning for you know, the school dance or something, and they're getting really into it. They're playing this kind of intense rock style, and they're in the gym, and the judges that are looking at them just have deadpan faces, and they are not impressed at all. And we'll get that scene, a similar picture, a similar scene again later in the movie, but it's just showing us how intentional each of these scenes is because pretty much all of them tie back to later parts of the movie, which I think is really smart writing. So what do we have in this scene? Again, another obstacle Marty faces. He's auditioning and he's rejected. Throughout this whole movie so far, it's been obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, and that's what you want for your protagonist. We haven't even gotten into the main part of the movie yet. Pfft, love it, love it. Mayor Goldie Wilson. Progress is his middle name. There again, we get yet another clue that's gonna come into play. Oh. Man, this movie is just so well written. Say what you want about popular films and blockbusters, but this is a this is a well written movie in my just my humble opinion. I'm never gonna get a chance to play in front of anybody. Marty says, I'm never gonna get a chance to play in front of anybody. So that's his goal, right? That that is his initial goal in this movie. And it's being frustrated right now. Even when he tried to play at Doc's house, he couldn't. But we're gonna find out later that he actually gets a chance to play in front of people that he was not expecting, which is so fun. Okay. What if I send in the tape and they don't like it? I mean, I just don't think I can take that kind of rejection. So here we get a great example of how to show who your characters are through their dialogue. Marty is a little bit insecure. He wants to be able to meet his goals. He's just a little bit timid about it. Dialogue is a great place to show who your characters are, what they're like. But you want to be really careful that you don't overdo it and have them describe what they're like. So Marty's not saying, I don't know, Jennifer. I'm just, I'm so insecure. No, he's saying like, what if they think I'm no good. It's a little bit on the nose, but not quite. So again, as you're creating dialogue for your characters, just think about how you can show who they are through what they're saying or through what they're not saying. How they react to things. In this case, he's reacting in a very particular way. It's not, oh, I can do this. They don't know what they're talking about. He's taking that to heart. And so that's a distinct character choice that tells us a little bit about who he is. And then he says, geez, I'm starting to sound like my old man. And that is another clue, another clue that we will need for later in this movie movie. Mmm, love it. Check out that 4x4. Four four. That is hot. 4x4 four four is another clue. Save the clock tower! Save the clock tower! And this is another clue. Wilson is sponsoring an initiative to replace that clock. 30 years ago, lightning struck that clock tower and the clock hasn't run 30 years ago, which was now way more than 30 years ago. Oh my god. Oh. Anyway, another clue. Even just setting that scene in the town square gives us a picture of the current day 1985 version of the town that will then be displaced by the 1955 version of that town. We see Marty's family set up here. So this is really important because we are eventually going to see what they were like in the past. Any girl who calls up a boy is just asking for trouble. You get a couple of instances at what Marty's mom is like. His mom's talking about how she doesn't like Jennifer because she calls him up and that's not right. But it's gonna set up a little bit of irony when we learn about what she's like when she was younger. When I was your I never chased a boy or called oh, a boy. Oh, did she? Sat in a parked car with a boy. Oh, didn't she though? And then of course, grandpa hit him with the car. That's another clue. I think what's really fun about time travel stories is that you can set up all of these clues that then come into play. Like if you're having characters talk about what things were like when they were growing up, and then you go back in time, you get to play around with what happens with that. And that's exactly what they do in this movie. But if you're writing, just think about how you can be intentional about what's going on. What are you, what details are you including about your characters, the scene, the setting up front in the beginning that are gonna set up your story for what takes place later. All right, we're gonna skip ahead. All right, okay, we'll fly. Get a grip on yourself. It's all a dream. So then we get our introduction to Doc. We see the missing plutonium, where that comes into play, and he's used it to create a time machine. This is really the catalyst of the story where everything is gonna change. Accidentally, Marty ends up back in time. So the great thing about a catalyst is that you want it to be something the character can't avoid, something your main character has to go through, or something that that they wouldn't have chosen themselves. Marty would not have chosen to go back in time. He says in the car, he's like, this is all just a dream. It's a really bad dream. He would not have chosen this. So that's the best kind of catalyst is one that forces your character into a new path. Don't I just love a DeLorean though? They're so cool. 
So then he ends up back in that main town square and we see it reimagined in its 1955 version. Oh, the cars are so cute. I love 50s cars. As Marty is looking around, none of this would have as much of an impact if we hadn't seen this place already in 1985. Because we've seen it already, we know what's different. And so that's why it's so important to set up the later events of your story earlier on. Immediately your reader understands what's different, what's changed, what's impactful about the later scenes. <laughs> So there the first clue comes into play. The clock tower is not broken anymore. It's working. Progress is his middle name. And then we have the second clue. Progress is his middle name is the same tag of this mayor who was running. And then he gets the newspaper. And what does he say again? This has got to be a dream. So again, this is how he's reacting based on his character, right? You want to have that consistency in your character development, especially in the beginning. You don't want your character to change their reactions too quickly. His reactions so far have been more on the side of caution, more on the side of disbelief. Belief. We don't want him to suddenly become confident, suddenly become secure. He needs to have a slower arc of change throughout the story. Oh, hey, Biff. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Hey, you got my homework finished, McFly? So then we get the great moment in all time travel stories when the main character from the future meets somebody in their life, but the past version. So in this case, Marty's meeting his dad, and it's just... So good! I love time travel stories. Because we've all wondered what it would be like if we could go back in time and meet our family members. What were they really like back then? Before, you know, before we could record everything on our phones. What were they really like? And then here we're getting the origin of the Biff and George relationship that we've seen a little bit of a hint at in the beginning, but now we're seeing it in 1955. And why is that significant? What does it tell us? By seeing that their relationship has been the same this long, it gives us a sense of impact. This has been how this relationship has gone forever since they were teenagers. Now that's a good idea. I could run for mayor. And then we get the other fun thing about time travel is where the main character accidentally sets something into motion that impacts the future. So he sort of accidentally tells this guy that he should run for mayor and that's what he ends up doing in 1985. This movie, this movie is so good. <laughs> So again, because we've had such good, crisp, concise setup in the beginning of this story, we understand why all of these following scenes have impact. Why does it matter that Marty got hit by this car? Because we heard his mom's dad hit Marty's dad with his car and that's how they met and ended up falling in love. Because Marty is now in the past, he got hit by the car and so we know the impact of that. So good. Just relax, Calvin, you've got a big bruise on Calvin. your head. She's so creepy. For my pants. Over there. On my hope chest. On my hope chest. <laughs> She's so creepy. I've never seen purple underwear before, Calvin. <laughs> She sets herself up in the beginning as being so, you know, modest and moral and oh, holier than thou. And then we see the true side of her in these clips and it's just, it's so funny. But again, it only lands well because of the setup. Girl, you're so creepy. Go, fine, go, good, fine. And he's so uncomfortable. Can you even imagine being in that situation? Sam, pay any attention to him. He's in one of his moods. Why didn't they take him to the hospital? Were there hospitals back then? So Marty's still hitting obstacles. He tries to follow his dad and get to know him more and he gets hit by the car. He just wants to find Doc, but then he ends up having to have dinner with his mom's family. And now he's finally able to go and find Doc. Doc? <laughs> Doc. So again, another obstacle. It's not easy for Marty, right? He's he's just trying to tell Doc, like, you gotta listen to me. I'm from the future. You made this ridiculous time machine, but Doc's not letting him. So I think what we can glean from this as writers is don't make it easy for your characters at any step of the way, even if they're just hitting small bumps in the road. Like this is a small bump in the road. Doc's just not letting him talk, but it still just creates a little bit of conflict and it brings out different colors in your characters and it makes a story more interesting. If Marty was just able to meet all his goals, no problem, we wouldn't even have a story. It would be super boring. My brother, my sister and me. Look at her sweatshirt, Doc. Class of 1984. And then we get another clue. Oh my gosh, we're in the middle of the story. We're still getting clues. He shows Doc the picture that will then come into play later on in the story. Come on, just 
just come on. Look at my birthday for crying out loud. I haven't even been born yet. And then again, Doc doesn't believe him, right? So another obstacle. And the only way that Marty can convince him is by using another clue that we were given in the start of the movie, which is that he knows how Doc got that bump on his head. You fell and you hit your head on the sink. And that's when he came up with the idea for the flux capacitor. So the only reason Marty is able to move past this obstacle is because of what happened earlier in the story. Are you sensing a theme here? All right, let's skip ahead a tiny bit. How am I supposed to go to the dance with her if she's already going to the dance with you? So here we get more obstacles. I mean, the main conflict that he's dealing with is how on earth is he gonna get back to 1985? Back to the future. So he's he's messed things up now, right? It, at first it was just, okay, I'm in 1955, I have to find Doc. But that idea got thrown out the window when he was hit by his grandpa's car. And then because of that obstacle, he met his mom who now has a crush on him and wants to go to the dance with him, which throws off his entire family history. So are we seeing that the original conflict has now expanded into a much bigger conflict. So while Marty's main goal is still to get back to 1985, he now has these sub obstacles that he has to get through in order to make that main goal happen. That's what makes an interesting story. And that's why the story is so fun to watch, at least in my she opinion. She doesn't know it yet. That's why we gotta show her that you, George McFly, are a fighter. So they make this whole plan and everything seems like it's gonna work out great. Marty has figured out how he's gonna fix all his problems. Now everything just has to go according to plan. Hmm. Her face. Gross, you just kissed your son like that, ew. The door opens, we all think that it's gonna be George, and who is it? It's Biff. So we get another conflict. The plan was going, he was gonna be all right. And then this is the obstacle. It's not what we expected. And what's great about this obstacle is now the stakes are even higher because we know that if Marty isn't able to pull off this plan and get his parents together, it's, it's not just about the present time that's gonna be affected, but his whole future is gonna be affected. So the stakes throughout the story keep getting higher and higher. And that's also what keeps the story really captivating. If the stakes aren't super high, why are we gonna care about what happens to a character? We might care, but it, probably not a whole lot. Look, I don't want to mess with no reefer addicts, okay? Yeah. Reefer addicts? The things you don't pick up on when you're watching this as a kid. So at this part in the story, the suspense really starts to build because nothing is going according to plan and we're starting to freak out. Why? Because there's a time limit on all of this. They don't have an endless amount of time to get Marty back to the future. They have to time this perfectly so that at the same moment the lightning strikes the clock tower, it'll pass down the wire to Marty's car as he's going exactly 80 eight miles per hour and he'll be able to go back into the future. So that's a, another great storytelling concept to keep in mind is not only we're making the stakes higher, like if they don't meet their goal, bad things are gonna happen. And then they're giving us a really tight deadline. There was another quote and I'm gonna, I don't remember who said this, but picture two people talking at a table, perfectly fine story, but maybe not that exciting. Now put a bomb underneath the table and have it start ticking. The characters don't know it's there, but you do. Suddenly the whole tension of the story changes and that's what we get in this part of the movie. I hate this part. <laughs> I hate this whole section of the movie because I'm always so stressed. Hey guys, you gotta get back in there and finish the dance. He can't play with his hand like that and we can't play without him. Yeah, well look, Mark. Another obstacle that gets in the way of Marty's goal, this guy can't play guitar and if he can't play guitar, then his parents can't dance, they can't have their first kiss, fall in love, etc, etc, etc. Scram, McFly. Cutting in. Then we get another obstacle. This guy interrupts his parents dancing and George doesn't have the confidence to say, back off, buddy. At least not in this moment. <laughs> Hey boy, you all right? Towards the end of the story, we're seeing that the consequences of all of these obstacles is starting to take effect. And that's a great way to, again, keep that tension building. You want there to be consequences to the fact that they're not able to meet their goal, that all these obstacles are happening. They should have consequences on your characters. And we're seeing that here. It really raises the stakes and raises the tension of the story because we're going, this is not going well. Nothing is working out. Marty is about to disappear from his family photo and he's the last one left. So it's all over. It's what some writers call the dark night of the soul. If you've ever used one of those novel outline beat sheets, like from Save the Cat, there's a part that's a dark night of the soul where everything seems lost. Nothing seems like it's going to work out. And you're basically like, I, how is this story going to end up? And that's what we have going on here. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. And then they all come back. So satisfying. 
And the great thing about this is we see character development in George, and the only reason that this is now working out is not actually because Marty did anything, although he encouraged George's character development, so you could say that that was a real catalyst for this. But George's actions are the one that actually make all of this possible, which is kind of funny when you think about it because his actions were always the actions that made the future what it was. So, all right, Marty is back in the picture. We get a glimmer of hope, like, oh, maybe everything's going to work out after all. And then, of course, a really satisfying moment for Marty as a character because he's able to confidently play his music the way he wants in front of a huge crowd of people. And we get that moment that I referenced before where he's like going off on this rock riff of Johnny Be Good and the crowd just ends up staring at him blank faced in the same gym that he played in the beginning of the movie. All right, let's skip ahead. So now we're entering the kind of the climax of the movie. This is where it all comes down to is Marty actually going to meet his goal or not? Is he going to get back to the future? We've had obstacle after obstacle and so now he's finally there, but time is running out. Do you have no concept of time? Hey, come on! Do you have no concept of time? <laughs> 7 minutes and 22 seconds. When this alarm goes off, you hit the gas. Hey! So there we get the quote unquote bomb under the table where Doc says, when this alarm goes off, you hit the gas because we they don't have a second to lose. And then he knows that Doc is gonna get shot because you saw it happen in the beginning of the story. So he's trying to warn Doc, which is another clue for what happens later. Then we get another obstacle, oh, man, it's honestly exhausting how many obstacles this poor character has to face. But a branch falls from the tree and breaks the connection in the wire, which basically means they're screwed. They're not gonna be able to, to get out in time. Then we have another obstacle when Doc gets to the top of the clock tower and he can't reach, it can't pull the cord over. At this point in the story, you're just going, this is never gonna work out. I'm so stressed. This is why I don't like this part of the movie. But that's because it's working. You're supposed to feel that angst and anxiety of like, is he gonna meet his goal? If he doesn't get back to the future, what's gonna happen? I love it. It's, a, it's good storytelling. You're, you're hooked. At least I'm hooked. Is anyone else hooked? I don't know. And then uh, we can breathe a sigh of relief. The climax of the story has happened. Marty met his goal. He is now back into the future. So now we enter the part of the story that's called the denouement or the falling action. And it's basically where we round out the story and we're tying it all up. It doesn't have to be all tied up in a perfect bow, but in this case, we'll see that things really get tied up pretty nicely. 124, I still got time. Of course, we have one more little piece of conflict, which is, is Marty gonna be able to save Doc? And what happens? He can't start the car. When I tell you that this movie is so good at giving the main character obstacles, like take notes. This is how you do it. And there go the our first antagonists. So that ups the tension, right? Because it's well enough to have Marty not be able to start the car, but when he sees the people drive by, we know, again, it gives us that sense of he does not have time. Even in the falling action of this story, we still have tension, we still have conflict. Go Marty! Run! Don't we love it when he arrives right on time to see it happen? How did that How did that work? How did he make it there in time? And then again, what I love about time travel stories is that you get to see it come full circle and now he's seeing himself before he goes into the past. And then the beautiful thing about this is that Doc actually did read his letter. He wore protective gear, he did not die. So, so our story is wrapping up now. There are there's not going to be any more conflicts, any more obstacles. At the end of the story, you really want to let your readers take a breath and get a sense that your story has settled in some way. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. <sighs> And then we see Marty's family and we see how different they are because of all the events that happened in the story. Those differences only work because it was set up so well in the beginning. Oh, hi Marty. I think it's this book. change is obviously the best. It's like kudos to these actors also, by the way. And then there's the truck. So we get that, that was a clue in the beginning and here it is. All right, so that was Back to the Future. Oh, still so good. <laughs> What can we take away from this movie? Number one, give your main characters obstacles at every step of the way. Make it hard for them to meet their goal because nobody wants to read a story about some, like, oh, I went to the store and I had this problem and it was easily solved. That's not interesting. Number two, having a really good catalyst that isn't the main character's fault, that they can't avoid and they didn't cause, the catalyst really has to happen to them in order to feel like it's not contrived. The third thing we can take away from this movie is having a good setup. So using the first part of your story to really concretely set up the events that happen later so that they have the impact that you want them to have. If you enjoyed this video, it really does help my channel if you can like and subscribe and let me know other movies that you'd like me to react to. As always, Thanks so much for watching. Take care and happy writing.